Yeah, well, I'm Jordan. Um, as Jacob said, this was my idea. So I thought that we'd start off this podcast essentially by providing an introduction to just some of the key philosophical ideas and, and thinkers that kind of underpin Scorpion movement as a whole and the, that have had a big influence on us. I mean, us three here, we have Jacob, myself, Jordan, and the Flying Kabbalah. We, you know, we have diverse interests. And our interests, philosophical interests are not completely identical, but there are definitely some uh, common areas of overlap. And specific thinkers that I think have influence, influenced us tremendously. Um, we can talk about Plato, Julius Evola, people like Oswald Spengler, um, and these various other thinkers that I think are relevant to this to this critique of modernity that we put forth that is, is, that is pretty central to our, to our entire movement. So um, I thought I'll pass it over to Flying Kabbalah here because... You've had, uh, he's had a pretty interesting sort of intellectual and philosophical transformation over the years. I mean, you, you got into Evel at the age of, I mean, just a couple 15. of years ago, I think 20, yeah, 15, uh, 2020, I think, right? Because you said that you read, um, you read Revolting into the Modern World, and then that, that book just really impacted you. And then that yeah. kind of got you into more intellectual pursuits. So if you could expand on that, I think that's a great way to get started here. Oh, yeah, exactly. Um, so I'll just introduce myself briefly. Um, I'm Flying Kabbalah. Um, so I am, I would say, interested in uh, traditionalist philosophy as well as Neoplatonic philosophy. Um, generally speaking, I like to put labels on my own, like Weltanschauung or like worldview. Uh, but I would say like, at least since um, a year or two, I have considered myself philosophically to be Neoplatonist. Um, I started with philosophy at a, a fairly early age, I would say, um, because, I mean, I got into like, right-wing circles when I was about uh, 14 and 15, uh, and through there, I was able to um, discover Julius Savola, um, so I obtained his work um, and read it when I was 15 years old, and I would say um, Julius Savola basically, um, I mean, gave me a, a view into another world. I mean, I guess he was kind of the rabbit hole. Um, in my life because um, I mean when I initially ordered uh, his work and got it I was expecting um, especially judging by the definition and description that Wikipedia gives of him just be kind of like a right wing uh, thinker but is uh, deep uh, I think he actually goes much deeper than that I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm not saying like his per he's a perfect um thinker and like that there were no um blemishes like involved him but i'd say like he's probably one of the best thinkers of uh the 20th century um and certainly a deep one um like with a lot of like illusion uh reference to tradition yeah. i mean stuff. discovering evola led me down so many rabbit holes because i mean i think we've all yeah. been had a, we've all had a pretty strong interest in politics for sure i mean for me it started in about well, that actually started really um, with the 2016 presidential election. I mean, I think that was a key watershed kind of moment for all of us because that got me interested in politics. It's just all that everyone yeah, yeah. talked about around me, you know, my family members, my friends at school. And, yeah, and then that's, that's when I, I started to realize, hmm, you know, there is this sort of deep division in this country within different you know, political factions. But for a while, I, I couldn't really conceive of, of politics as anything beyond this pretty simplistic dichotomy of liberal versus conservative and though it's do you believe in this amount of government intervention in the economy or why amount of government intervention in, econ in the economy and you know it was a very materialistic perspective and i couldn't really i couldn't really transcend that paradigm but then discovering thinkers like evola i mean just seemed so radical t to me at the time like that just opened the door to so much interesting philosophy for me because he's i mean he rejected and I think because I, I want to talk about third position as politics here because, you know, Keith Woods, he made a, a really interesting video two years ago about, you know, the Nazbul Vortex. He said, is the Nazbul Vortex coming? Is this actually what used to be some strange, you know, political movement actually from rising into the mainstream? And I think, I think it is. And I think the re recent developments have made that very clear. And in order to understand those developments, you need to understand Evola because he rejected not only you know liberalism free market capitalism but also marxism and sort of offered this this unique perspective where he says as long as we're talking about you know 
these materialist concepts, matters of economic relations, class relations, production, GDP, things along those lines, we're so far off from the real issues that, I mean, it's just not even close. And so well, he like offers this, modernity, in other words. Yeah, yeah, the, the, you know, that's sort of the defining, uh, some of the defining features of modernity, it's very materialistic worldview. And so when he, yeah. you know, when he had these spiritual and um, ancient mystic and even some occult elements mixed in, I think occultism is pretty important here. That just kind of blew my mind. That's actually what led to me um, making a presentation on him in philosophy class a couple of years ago. That definitely attracted the interest of the class because everyone else just kind of picked the most normie philosophers out there. I mean, I have nothing against people like John Locke and, and Thomas Hobbes, but it's obvious that they didn't really have a genuine interest in these slinkers. They just selected them based off of the list that our, you know, the teacher provided. And so people were kind of just sleeping through the entire class. And I brought up Evola and we got into, you know, sex, magic, and occultism and all this, all these out there topics. Yeah, that's when they really and started I, paying attention. Like, yes, yeah, exactly, yeah. Just for Gen Z, you know, just say, oh yeah, sex, magic, and, you know, other other more extreme topics. But I think, I think some people kind of dismiss, like... If you look up Evola in these, I guess, more normie or mainstream right and left-wing circles, a lot of people dismiss him as this sort of mystic or, like, fantasist or just strange, like, you know, wizard-type figure. But, I mean, these topics are still important. I, I wrote a whole essay on this, actually, about the intersection between occultism and politics, uh, especially far-right reactionary politics. That's the newest video. What's well, the first video that we actually have in the Scorpion Movement channel? Mm -hmm. Like, we're saying that this intersection is influencing, I mean, world geopolitics. I talked about Alexander Dugan in that, in that essay. Uh, I definitely want to get to Dugan at some point. But I think, um, because Flying Cabal, I know that you're very interested in, in the critiques of the sort of materialist philosophy. I think if we could delve into that, that'd be interesting. Because that is kind of the philosophy, this materialist and, you know, empiricist, sort of atheist world he does kind of underpin uh underpin modernity oh yeah and i think, uh, Pla and I think oh. platonism because we mentioned plato as well and yeah plato was definitely a key influence on evola i think platonism and especially platonist metaphysics can, can sort of provide an alternative to this so oh yeah um i mean i think platonism was an influence on um evola but probably not like a, a chief one but definitely one among them. I mean, he does like cite Plato and Plotinus like throughout his works. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You you mentioned like um, Evola being opposed to Marxism and free market capitalism. To kind of add yeah. on to that, uh, in Revolt Against the Other World, or in another work, uh, not exactly sure, but he basically uh, puts uh, Marxism and capitalism um, kind of on the same tier. Like, uh, so to speak, like, the, he basically thinks of them as equivalent because, I mean, they're both materialistic systems that um, are, like, removed <laughs> from tradition, yeah. like, they're a divine realm, like, so to speak. Yeah. Mm. And uh, I think, I mean, there's, the there's actually, like, a, mm. uh, in Revolt Against the Modern World, he, like, uh, also goes into the theory, um, like, I mean, I'm assuming most viewers are going to be familiar with the, like, four portite. Uh, caste system of Hinduism. Yes. So, like, the, they had the Brahmins, um, and then the warrior caste, uh, and then the merchant caste, and the, like, I guess, farmer caste. Um, I, I guess, like, to basically summarize uh, what he discusses uh, quite a bit in his book, uh, Revolt, he basically sees, like, the history of modernity as like, power being passed, like, to those classes. So, like, um, he thinks that. Uh, during the Golden Age, like, power was held by the Brahmins. Um, and then the Silver Age, power was, um, like, held by the warrior caste. So, like, you know, Alexander the Great, for instance. Uh, and, like, uh, military chiefs, like, so to speak, being in charge of power. And then, like, with free market capitalism, so, like, um, from about, like, the sixth, from about the, like, 17th century on uh, to, well, to hitherto. Like we have the like merchant class kind of in charge of power, um, and also, I guess, they uh, control like, all the financial um, organs of government. And he sees Marxism as uh, basically the low, like the lowest caste, 
like the working um, and subsequently, I guess, dirtiest yeah. class. Yeah, taking control of power because, I mean, Marxism is ultimately like egalitarian and focused on the working class. So I guess yeah. you kind of see Marxism as the end I, of history. And I think, yeah, which it is actually funny because there's this uh, prominent liberal thinker, international relations named Francis Fukuyama, who also has a who also has this book called The End of History. You know, he's coming at it from the complete op opposite perspective of Evola. And I'm actually in the process of writing an essay where I kind of I essentially refute the thesis that Fukuyama puts forth in that book. But I wanted to bring that up because in the end of history, Fukuyama states essentially that look now that the Cold War is over and the Soviet Union has collapsed, we're entering the reign where liberal, liberal democracy is, is pretty much entrenched as a political system worldwide. It is the dominant system, the sort of liberal capitalist hegemony, and it's not going away anytime soon. And because of this, you know, this ties into something called Golden Arches Theory, which is which essentially states, I mean, it's in reference to this idea that the two countries with McDonald's will not go to war with each other, but it states, you know, liberal capitalist democracies are, are generally more peaceful and they don't go to war with each other, they don't invade each other. So I think it's kind of, kind of a naive concept. But the reason I bring up Fukuyama is because I think Evola kind of has the complete, you know, opposite stance opposite. on Yeah, that. yeah, exactly. Yeah, and because you talked about this cyclical conception of history, right, and, and the exactly. ideas that borrowed from Hinduism. Well, but he, another, what he borrowed from Hinduism, which I think most people, this is one of the most, this term is actually becoming much more popular recently, uh, is the idea that we live in the Kali Yuga, which, which in Hinduism is, is the Dark Age. And it's this period of spiritual cultural decay, yeah. Uh, yeah metaphysical sort of degradation and decay and so i think he see he, and what he says is we're, we're actually going to be seeing a lot more sort of violence and, and chaos 